Welcome to the Merry Boozers. We're uh, today. We're really glad to have you back. Uh, we're doing episode two. I hope you've seen episode one. If you didn't, go back and uh, look at episode one. I'm back in my hometown of Big Spring, and I'm talking with a, one of my mentors that taught me a lot of stuff. Was Charles Busby. Charles, great to have you on the channel. Glad to be here. Uh, our first episode, we went through the evolution of the electronics or the, the uh, radios, which you see out in front of you now. We decided to leave the radios out. This episode is going to be about Charles's experience and some of mine. I have nowhere near the experience Charles does. Excuse me. Uh, and on the first episode, Charles said he started in the early 50s, and that's where we're going we're gonna to do it again. Okay. But this time we're going to talk about the airplanes. Okay. And any other else silly things we can talk things about. <laughs> Lots to, of that. To re, re, uh, kind of recondition our memories to what we experience. So guys, I'm going to try to give you an experience of what it took to, we've already talked about what it took to put together a radio. You just didn't buy a radio, you got, you got a box, and you had to solder it all together. Well, it was kind of the same way about the airplane. Yeah, that's right. So, Charles, what uh, we're going to start, you, I think you said the blue radio mm -hmm. was late 50s. Yeah. Two, uh, two channels. So what One time? channel. One channel, but mm -hmm. what type, and, and uh, what was 049? 049. Engines, so we're talking about you control engines, uh -huh. but with some type of radio control. Yeah, escapement. Escapement to control the airplane on free, free flight. Free, free flight. Free flight, okay. <laughs> I haven't been drinking, but there are certain things that come along you can't say. Free flight might be one of the ones that I got to talk about. <laughs> okay, so anyway, you you had to build this airplane. It come, right. I, I assume that it was Balsa. Balsa, and it's they was not stamped out in parts like they are now. You got sheets of Balsa and a set of plans. You cut out your own ribs, spars, everything, and built your airplane. You, so. There was no fast glue, cyanoacrylic. You used epoxy and Elmer's and straight pins to hold it together until it dried. Or however else you could So, do. no stamp. The first, some of the first model airplanes I experienced, kits, was stamped. Kits. Stamped. They wouldn't, today they may come out of, let's see, they're called, uh, they're really nice. All you do is snap them out. Yeah. I mean, it, but the stamped kits, it was almost like taking you had to cut them out. out. Yeah, but it was it was actually well, stamped. The first ones out. that I had was just sticks of balsa in the plans, and then you, you drew it out and cut it out. Right, it was a long process. Yeah. So, so what did you build? I mean, when you started building a wing, you would build a half a wing, right? Mm -hmm. You build a half a wing, and you would pin it to the plan. Right? Mm, plans wow. wasn't that big. Okay. You just so, built it and pinned it together and kept it straight. Okay. All right. So yeah. you didn't even put the, the plans, what, the blue plant plans wasn't even coming out nope. then. Mm -mm. In the sick. <laughs> 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 okay. Here's your box of balls. Up. Yeah, I understand that. Okay. So, That's it. So you used uh, the old, uh, uh, you had to mix your epoxy. Yeah. And yeah. I tell you what, I got some of the old kits and this stuff. When it dried, you wasn't getting it back together. No. I mean, you wouldn't go, oh, oh, I think I cut this part because you globbed it in there. I mean, it was like, you must have poured it in there because it was like globbed on these things. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, the, okay, so the covering was silk span, six span mm -hmm. which is, is a cloth, right? Well, well it's well, paper, well, really. Paper, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's a shrinkable paper. Okay. Uh, you cover your wing with it and get it as tight as you can and then you, what they call dope it, uh, which is really just a, uh, a lacquer 
uh, you paint this dope on it and let it set a few minutes and it turns white and shrinks tight. I mean tight. I mean you can thump it. You, I mean, thump, you can thump it. Thump it. it yeah. It's hard. Mm -hmm. and, and, and out here in West Texas, guys, we have little things called mesquite trees. Mm -hmm. And we also have things called uh, stickers or, or, or the better word for them is cuckleburg. Not cuckleburg, <laughs> but uh, uh, sandburrs. Sandburrs, grass they burrs. Come, all out of the stickers. <laughs> and then you can't walk out of here barefooted. No way. No way. So any of that stuff would poke a hole in your airplane. So just so you know, <laughs> it's uh, it's not a, the West Texas is not a real pleasant place to fly mm -hmm. airplanes. Even in the days of Monaco was those Good old mesquite trees just love that. Oh, yeah, yeah. But anyway, let's. Okay, and Monaco so, is a little tougher than the silk span. Well, but yeah. it, it's still. So, silk span lasted uh, uh, that primitive. Here's your box of balsa, and and here's your plans, but they're not full size plans. No, not lasted full -size. how long, would you say? Oh, probably two or three years, not very long. Okay. Then they went to stamping the. The, uh, the, the wood, wood where you had to cut it out with an exacto and put it together right. and they even had the big plans then right so now what you're doing to build is you'd have a flat table like this and i remember what i built on was an old ceiling tile mm -hmm. now it, uh, for a small airplane and you couldn't do that on a, a larger airplane but yeah or you put two tile and you start getting put your table together. longer but anyway or you belt I remember building a, a like quarter of the wing, quarter of the wing, then put them together. Mm -hmm. But you, but you put that plan down, and you put your your spars, and you'd use pins or magnets. I remember when we got really fat, where you was able to put the magnets yeah. in between. Magnets to hold them. Yeah, and hold then we your got, ribs up and these spars too. And then we got a wing jig. Yeah, the that wing, was real late. Ooh, yeah, well that was that was. In the 80s, early mm -hmm. 80s was a wing jig, the mm -hmm. first time I ever seen that. But anyway, here we go. So we're we're into the 60s and we're getting stamped uh, kits. Mm -hmm. We still are using the same technique to put them together. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, well, I think the Monaco come out in the 60s. Okay, I don't. I, it was already out when I started yeah. in the eighties. I was going to ask you when the when you thought it was. I think the late sixties when it first came out. We used silk span up till it come out, and then it was so much easier that. And it weighed a hell of a lot. Oh, less. a whole lot less. And, yeah. And and uh, uh, evolution of the motors. Now you, you're uh, are, you're still using four nines. When did you first start seeing? I mean, they were building uh, gas-powered motors in the 40s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there was one laying right there. Had, you had one right here. This is... This uh, is yeah, that one. Yeah, this one right here was, if you guys can see that, this was kind of in the 40s. Yes. And that is actually got an ignition system. It's got a spark plug, and there's a coil mounts with it, and there's a set of points that... Well, this is not the one that's got the points on it. The other one has the one that had the points on it. But uh, yeah, these and they have a spark plug, guys. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give them a short. I'm gonna, I'm gonna and you uh, you stand adjusted up front the points of the here. Now a lot of you guys might have seen these, but this actually has a spark plug, run off of gasoline, right? Yes, just regular old gas and a, a prop, and that that's the carburetors built on in it. Uh, and actually, it, it's just a Ventura. Ventura, yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, so. Here we are in the 60s, and, and we're still, we've got a stamp kit, but what are we using as far as a motor? Well, I, I had a McCoy Redhead 35 that I used. It, it's uh, wingspan on airplanes about 40 or 45 inches, uh, and uh, still didn't have all the radio that you needed, so no ailerons, just rudder and elevator, no okay. throttle control. Okay. Okay. And... Uh, you put dihedral in the wings so that it would, when you put rudder in it and turned it, you took the rudder out, the dihedral will level it back out in the okay. wings. Okay. And uh, I flew like that for, I guess in the early 60s, 65, 66. And then I got where I could afford the, the good ones. Now, when did, when did actually the, 
the two-stroke motor we think of today come along? Oh, that was in the 80s. Just, to, just with the carburetor and everything? I mean, oh, no, no. You're talking about... Just the, you, the you ones that was throttle control yeah, throttle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they come in in the in the uh, early sixties. Early sixties. Yeah. Really. Okay. Uh -huh. Because but I they was a little expensive. Yeah. Okay. So you're gonna start hitting your part of the world as far as the controllable mm -hmm. right here, mm -hmm. which we said this was in the late sixties, right? Yeah. Actually, I, my first uh, throttle controllable airplane, which was a uh, plastic ARF and I cannot remember the manufacturer of it but that was what I had the little red brick in the EK yeah, we talked about the red brick if, if you miss that so so we we're into the 70s with this radio mm -hmm. which is as we said this is a four channel radio mm -hmm. right yeah so we're we're on this radio we've already got the four basic Channels. Mm -hmm. channels to fly the airplane mm -hmm. and we're in the, still in the stamp kits we're still into we're, no, we no, no 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 yeah. that they had actually come they were the the kits were stamped but they was actually stamped through and you could break them out break so them you out have to cut them out right so that's yeah. in the late 60s yeah so, so we, we everybody was complaining about having to cut them out so they said okay we can have we can make them it's always a thing that they're doing manufacturers always hear the customer and they, they upgrade, upgrade. Them. If they're willing to pay for it, they can get it done, right? Right, exactly. So yeah. here we come out with a stamp kit, but all you do is break it out now. And then true it up. And true it up, <laughs> yes. Sand it up. You had to sand every part off to make it sure that it was Right, flat. all the ribs the same size and, you know, but everything. we got Monaco, mm -hmm. and we're still doing the the uh, the gluing by uh, uh, epoxy, epoxy and, and uh, Elmer's. White glue. White glue. Uh, that was up into the 70s, okay. uh, late 70s. So here we are with this radio. Mm -hmm. This is about the, the late 70s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. get, that's when I came along, and uh, I remember the, the, the plane that I got was, everything was come already cut out. Yeah. And everything yeah. was nice. I mean, it was yeah, and that's about the same time they started with the cyano acrylic, okay. which so, made so, it a lot simpler. Yeah, but you know, I don't think that that stuff is as powerful as it was when we start. You remember when we put together a kit, and you could start putting together a wing, and you'd have smoke going everywhere. I exactly. Mean, it, there was smoke everywhere. They don't smoke like it used to. Right. I, I don't know what they did to it, but boy, back in the 80s, you could start... And you could fill a room with that stuff. You'd have to get out of there because it would it would set. We call it, out. We, we said it sets off. Yeah, sets it's off. set off. Get out. Get out because it would smoke like. Uh, but it, you put it together, it was three times as fast as putting it together with with that White other loop. crap. Yeah, I mean it was just like. Sh -sh -sh. Yeah, Man. and and, Real I, quick. and that's where I think his building really went rapid there. I mean you could really kick out those. Planes. Build one pretty quick. Yeah. So, uh, we talked about on the other video the first time we ever seen an ARF or a almost ready, almost to, fly. ready to fly. And we called it a Dura Fly and it was made of PVC. Yeah. Was the first one we kind of re re really re remember. Uh huh. And then there was some ARFs out there, but they were junk. I mean, they were really just. Junk, yeah, and a little overpriced for yeah, what they were. A little for what they were putting out. Mm -hmm. And then we were talking about the first time that I remember you coming to me and you brought out that it was a Cat 21. It was made by a company named Model Tech. Model Tech. And you said to me, and I can't believe you said it. He said, he said I can't build it for what they're building for their, what they're selling it for. for. Yeah, yeah that's, and, a, that's a real good airplane. And it had to be a damn good one for you to buy it because of the way you built. Yeah. So Model Tech, I remember, and it was a pretty, I mean, they bought, they, that's the first ones I remember making a line of ARFs that was worth anything. Yeah. yeah. But they, they wasn't cheap, but they were I mean, you know what I'm saying, but. Uh, I think I've still got a couple of Model Tech kits upstairs. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, that's another thing. He, you said you got like 20 kits yeah, 20, upstairs. 20, 25, something. Still, 
in the box. But uh, uh, Charles started buying the kits. I remember he was saying, well, I'm going to buy them because when I get older, I might not be able to afford them. So That's he it. bought them all, and he's still got quite a few. Got quite a few, and now I just don't have the time to do what I want to do. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, and he got into loading guns. Uh, the, well, the problem is with Charles, he'd still be in this if he had somebody to fly with. Yeah, but, exactly. But, you know, one of our sayings on the Mary Boozer channel is fly with your friends. Well, you know, it isn't very much fun if you're out there just flying by yourself, is it? Yeah, it's not, well, but it's I, okay. I still do it. Well, I understand, but it's okay, but it's a lot better if you have somebody to fly right, with. Right, exactly. So, you know, guys, take take it for a grain of salt that you have somebody to fly with and enjoy this sport together because it's a lot better. And I retired in 2013 and uh, we had a, just a, we probably had one of the best flying fields in West Texas. We, yep. had, we had a converted municipal airport that we took the runways out of and we built the sheds. And the Bad only room. problem is, is we couldn't get anybody to do it anymore. Yeah. We, we begged and pleaded for the younger guys to come in and we, well, we started, well, when, when we were younger, we did all the work for the older guys. Yep. And we all, what we always say, well, oh, when we got older, we're going to sit back and watch some other guys work. <laughs> Only problem is there wasn't ever any other guys. Yeah, there wasn't no, yeah, it always so does. I'm just telling you, it's, uh, but, it, you know, I, I, I really, uh, when we talked about our, our club here that started, you said it started in 65 and it ended Well, that's somewhere. when I joined it, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's uh, and oh boy, you think about all the old guys that was in that club and, Mm -hmm. There's very few of them around anymore, are there? None of them. Well, I mean, there are some. Robert Walker. Yeah, I mean, I'm the, talking the, about the old guys like yeah. Andy Arcan and yeah. and uh, 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 back 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 in the early '60s. There was really none of them that was in there in the '60s. It's was in the later in the '80s and the '90s. They, right, they, right. They're, they're all gone. gone. Yeah. All gone. Yeah. Uh, Oh, I'll never forget old man, old man in Max Barnes. Oh yeah. Oh man. Uh, uh, um, uh, Andy Arcan, uh, that fuselage hanging on the wall right over there is one that Andy yeah. Arcan started. Right, I remember when I first joined the club, that old the the the, the old coffee clutch mm -hmm. would go down to his electronic shop, and they would build on that airplane. Yep, but they never did finish it. Never did finish. We'll it. show you that. We'll, we're going to get up and walk around Ch uh, Charles's shop and show you some of the many airplanes. And I think he's got rid of a lot of them, but I have. I mean, he's got rid of. But there was a this this whole room is an upstairs of, above his two car garage that he built on and dedicated nothing to but to to his model uh, uh, hobby, and uh, that's what he built this for. But now a lot of he converted this, it. He converted it to he's loading uh, gun uh, ammunition ammunition now. Yeah. So anyway, uh, here we go. We're we're into the seventies now. We've actually started seeing ARFs. Mm -hmm. um, I I'm, I'm going to talk about. I started in the eighties and mm -hmm. flew from about eighty two to nineteen eighty seven when I got married, and I couldn't afford it any longer. You went through that situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you you kind of. Kept doing it, but it, there was a lull, and then it kind of got a kind in the. I start. I joined the club back in '98. Yeah. From '88 to '98, I didn't do it because I couldn't afford it. Had two kids, was trying to make a living. Same here. And in 1988, uh, 1998, Wesley is 10 years old. Yeah. And my wife says you need to find something to do with your your son. And, that, and that's not like I didn't do Boy Scouts and yeah. baseball and yeah. stuff like that. But she said, I think you guys need to do something. And I go, well. And then I ran into you at a Young Eagles event. Yep. Young Eagles was doing the flights for for the FAA. Yeah, out to at the airport. To get young people interested in aviation. But we, we put on a demonstration out there that day. That's it, right. And we went out there with the Boy Scouts, or Cub Scouts, or whatever mm -hmm. it was. 
and there stood Mr. Busby, and I said, hey, Wesley, you want to fly a radio control model airplane? And he was about 10. 10 nine, nine, years old. 9 or 10. And I go, Charles, come over here and get my son. And he, he put Wesley on the buddy box. Well, that's another thing we need to talk about. Anyway, uh, Wesley got to fly, and Charles says, hey, why don't you try? I said, oh, shoot, I forgot everything about it. He said, no, he'll come back to you. Well, he gave me, it was a trainer. It was, I think it was a uh, uh, senior telemaster. Senior telemaster or, or one of those or a Goldberg, no. whatever. I don't remember. It was a tricycle gear, high, high wing uh -huh. airplane. And I flew it and the bug got me. <laughs> and I started, I, I, I said to my wife, I said, well, if you can afford about, I, I don't know, I, five, it was, I used to tell everybody you could get into this for about 500 bucks. Yeah. That's about, about, about that. that. Time was, you could, but you, it was kind of minimum, but you could get into it for about 500 bucks. You buy a radio. You were and if you, easy with your money. Frugal yeah. and yeah. you didn't buy the very best of stuff. So anyway, I think I remember buying a Tower Hobby ARF trainer, mm -hmm. 40 size. Uh, OS uh, uh, 46. 46. Mm -hmm. And flew. I'm, I'm trying to think of the name of the airplane, but I can't think of it. Well, no, it was a tower. The first one I bought was just, they still make that tower hobby mm -hmm. trainer. Yeah. Tricycle gear, squat right. and the tail. And I always didn't like it because it squat in the tail. And the, anyway, but it squat in the tail would take off to this trainer. Yeah. It had a lot of. I girl in it, and I got, I flew it for, I don't know, four or five months, and I, I wanted Wesley to learn how to fly, and, and uh, but he just didn't know how to concentrate at that time, yeah. and we'll go, we're going to go into that one. <laughs> anyway, Wesley's 10 years old, it don't work. He yeah. just, he's just not there yet, Yeah. So, but I keep, I start flying a little bit at a time. Two years rocks along, and, and I say to Charles, I said, Charles, I can't train him. Would you train him? He said, well, sure will. I'll try. And I'll never forget. Never forget. Standing out there. We, we had a buddy box at that time. You could you could put a cord between two two and buddy box. Right. You had to set them up and get the controls set. But it's, if you got it right, yep. you, you I it. held the switch, and if he got in trouble, I turned it loose in his mind. Yep. And here you go. Charles B. Okay, Wesley, listen to what I'm saying. Turn left. Wesley, that's right. Turn left, Wesley. <laughs> okay, so uh, Wesley, fly level, Wesley. Wesley, you're climbing, Wesley. Are you paying attention to what I'm telling you, Wesley? <laughs> oh, okay, turn, turn left now. Wesley, turn left. Left, Wesley, towards us, not away from us. And then... Um, I don't know, that was two or three flights of that. And mm -hmm. one day, uh, Charles said, Damn it, Wesley, if you're not going to pay, pay attention to me, he just unplugged the radio and said, Fly the thing. <laughs> In the ground, I'm going, What? 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 what, what? He said, He don't pay attention to a damn thing, I'm telling you. Anyway, that was Wesley's first experience on, because, you know, it's like trying to be a baseball coach to your son. Right. I thought, I'm not going to try this, but Wesley was too much for this guy, <laughs> and he could train anybody, but anyway. Uh, yeah, but he got pretty good after that. But Well, he turned. It was amazing. It, it was like a switch. I don't know. I tell a lot of people will ask me, when do you start training your uh, kid to fly? Different kids are different ways. Mm -hmm. It just depends on how it's... It, it's it's how their brain operates between their brain and their hands, and it just clicked. And yeah. one of the day I got out there and said, I told him, I said, listen to what I'm saying. If you ever listen, and 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 not try to fly. He always wanted to fly acrobatics and stuff. Uh -huh. He wanted to see what it could do. And I said, look, you don't do that when you first start. And anyway, that one day it clicked. And he just took it from, and he was flying. He went in, I bought him that, that uh, LT-40. LT-40. 
which was an ARF mm -hmm. with a 40 size, and, it, and that's a great airplane. Yeah, it's a great airplane. And they still make it today. He took that airplane and started flying it, and then I bought a thing called a hot rod. It was made in Vietnam. It was an ARF. I didn't want to spend a hell of a lot of money for him to... Yeah. Because he still liked the hot rod. He, yeah. That was the art in his name, is hot rod. But uh, built that, and he took took the wings and flew it off of that plane. And then I let him, I, you remember that fun fly T-51? Yeah. With the rubber band wings? Yep, sure and did. That was not an easy an airplane to fly. Nope, nope. But he, <clears throat> and he's talked about that on our channel, and he's actually got that airplane hanging up in the, in the ceiling, if you guys are, are boozer and been kind of down the road, that airplane is actually hanging in his. But that was a hard plane to fly, and that little stink could stink that thing on the gear every time and just amaze everybody. And he was about 13, 14, I guess, somewhere in there when, he really, when he really started it. Yep. And that's what started his career. It's amazing what starts kids' careers in this sport. So yep. we've kind of divvied away from that. But now let's talk about how we train people. Let's start over here. You just trained yourself. That's right. It was just get out there and grit it. Get out there and do it. And then even through in here. Yeah, yeah. But uh, then came along what? Uh, passing the box. <laughs> <laughs> passing the box. Right. When I got here, well, I think they, this was right before, some of these are right before the, they had a plug in. Now, this one that does have the track. Yeah. yeah, that one you could hook the buddy so, box to. Not this, this one you couldn't. This was past the box, and then they come along here. And this is the late 70s, early yeah. 80s is when you actually, here you pass the box. The, the, the guy that was training you, he'd be over here. And he'd be flying, and he'd get way up in the air. He'd say, okay. And I didn't have a clue. He, you know, he said, this is up, that's down, this sideway, okay. You, know, yeah. you got it? Oh, yeah, I think I got it. I'll never forget my first flight. <laughs> my foot was shaking so damn bad. I couldn't go, I got it, I got it. But anyway, you, he'd say, okay, here we go. <laughs> and then you'd fly it, and he'd go, oh, 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 and he'd go grab it real fast back, and then get it, he'd get it back. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it did. But that's the first way yep. that we taught somebody to fly was passing the box. Yep. And then it come along in the 80s that we had a hard wire that plugged right in here to another box like to this. another box like this. You couldn't use another brand. You had to use if it was Fatava, you had to use it. it but was, no no crystal in it. No, yeah, no, you did the, the dummy box. It, yeah. It was a dummy box. Yeah. But it was had the controls, but uh, no, no crystal. That's right. So anyway, that's where it came along here. Now today, you know that we can, we, we don't even have to have the hard wire between them. You you actually, it's programmed between the radios. There's a there's a function in the radio that says trainer. Yeah. And you you program it for the trainer, and you have no buddy box for it. So anyway, that's how that evolved on the buddy box right. and how to train them. But some of us just grit your teeth and go for it. That's and it. then another thing was uh, uh, most of you would say, okay, first time you land, you're on your own, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> first time you land, you're on your own. But, but okay, but, but I mean, uh, and I remember another thing. There was always those people that didn't want to have them built. So they'd always say, Charles, would yep. you build me an airplane? And what was your answer? Do you remember your answer? <laughs> yeah. What was it? <laughs> yeah, I'll show you how. <laughs> and or you said, this is a. If I start building airplanes, it's not a hobby anymore. It's a business. It's just business. Yep. And I'll help you all you can, but I'm not building you an airplane. And there's a lot of old men. The old men in those days said, if you're dedicated to this, if you really want to do this. You gotta you, learn. You gotta learn. Yep. But I remember you saying that. As soon as I start building your airplanes, it's not a hobby, it's a business. That's right. So I'm not I got a business. Don't need is, don't need another one. And this is my hobby. So yep. that was the answer to, hey, would you build me an airplane? 
most of the time. Now, help you all you want. Yeah, all you want. Answer all the questions you want. If you try, I, I don't know how many tries I start a kit, and then I get, I, I'll never forget, I was building a Sig Cooper. And you said to me, you better watch out for the incidents. Yep. Because the, they don't do a very good job as Cut far as the, the, the saddles lead. out of the wing. And I go, incidents? <laughs> and incidents meter? And you go, yeah. Well, what does one look like? I, well, anyway, an incidents meter. I, I, yep, there they are right there. Show them an incidents meter. That This is... They, they come out with electronic ones and everything, but Robart made an incidence meter. And all it is is a penny. If you, go, if you dig into that, there's a penny up here that's weighted, and that needle swings back and forth, and all it's doing is showing you what uh, angle the wing is. What angle the wing is. And, and the kit would tell you that you needed to put either positive or negative or neutral in the wing. Yep. To make it fly correctly. Nearly all of them had a, a positive in them. Positive wing. So mm -hmm. we, the, the, what, what he's talking about is that Center wing, line of the fuse. It, it, yeah, center line of the fuse, but you put like a positive up in the wing. Yep. So when it took off, it started flying. If you had negative in it, it fatted. Right. Yeah. You would, you would, You'd have to hammer on the elevator yeah. and it, it, it would go right. so snap on the ground. All this is built into those ARFs today, all the phonies and all this. But that wasn't that way. You had to check, and you also had to do the incident on the tail. On the tail, the stab. Well, today you have to do make sure that they're if you're putting a stab on, that everything is square. That's all you're doing today. But in our day, when you're building one of these things, you had to have the incident meter, and you draw the thrust line on the fuse. Yep. And you you get it level. And then build from there. And then build from there. And the motor actually had to have. Two degrees right right and down something. and down one degree down yeah and that's already built in those arf today too guys that you don't have to worry about i mean but in our day when you were building these things that all came into you had all kinds of stuff to look at that right and if you didn't build it right it didn't fly it didn't fly worth a fluid you know, <laughs> and so this is an incidence meter and there's a little thing called we started playing with with dihedral, we'd either take it out or add it in. Mm -hmm. uh, to the now, dihedral is is what the wing is. Yeah, the candied can, up on the, on, up. The, on the tips, and your high performance planes don't have any dihedral. All of your trainers have got a little dihedral in them. Yeah, because they're they're, they'll, they're self correcting. Yeah, yeah, right. But but if you get, I mean, we we built straight across. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to get performance. You straight across. And, and, and I talked to you guys about that P47 that didn't have dihedral in it. I think why uh, Nextra built that P47 with no dihedral is exactly what we're talking about, maybe. But anyway, that's something we built on the channel. And uh, the P47, you know, had dihedral in it. Right. But this kit was built straight, and I think they probably corrected that to, for performance in it. Uh, a yeah, bit. the the models will actually, if you want performance, they they got to take the dihedral out of them. Mm -hmm. That's that's the only way they're. So so if we we've talked about uh, what was so so all of these kits we were flying on two most of the first beginning we was talking about two stroke engines mm -hmm. we 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 started with two strokes like 20, 25, 20, 15s. Something like that. Was it two fifteens through one hundred? Uh, 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 no, nineties. Nineties. Uh -huh. I remember when I was warbirds in the eighties were crap because mm -hmm. they were built up heavy as bricks, and the only way you could correct it is throw more horsepower. Out. That's right. And the first sixty size warbirds that you ever built, if you put a sixty in them, you mm -hmm. might as well. They were crap. You, you, they were underpowered. Seventy-five or, or a ninety. A 90. They started. Uh, OS started making a two-stroke ninety-one. Yeah. And they actually kind of came to life after that, but yeah. they're still a flying brick. Yeah. When you turn the power off, you well, you don't probably turn the power off. You land it under under power. With land it under power. Old. Uh, uh, matter of fact, you've got a Spitfire over there that you never did finish, but 
That's that's the old. Uh, that was one we was talking about. Mm -hmm. We had to really land it under power. Yep. Because it snapped in a heartbeat. Or like that SR seventy one, forty sides of that bill. Yeah. You landed it under full power. Full power. You didn't, you didn't slow it down. You didn't. If this man would come along and say, you know, I think I'm going to build me an SR-71. Well, what kid are you? I'm not going to use it, kid. I'm just going to scratch build it. I'm going to, you know, I can build that damn thing. <laughs> and sure enough, here it come. Here's this SR-71 that had a four-stroke pusher. Mm -hmm. And it was a... Fast. It, it, yeah, it was fast, but it was a... You better know how to fly. <laughs> I've seen, oh, oh, here's another thing. i got to talk about this man. This is the only man that I know that could fly, a, lose an elevator and still save the airplane. Now, I tell you what, guys, you want, you want to see a real pilot. I, I don't care if you lose power. I don't care if you lose ailerons. I don't care if you lose rudder. I don't care if you lose anything, but I, I'm a, a true blue pilot. It's one that can land one that you don't have elevator. elevator. Now, well, tell if it's them, set up right, if it's power, you can control it with power. Yep. And that's what I've done. I lost elevator on a long ship off. Right. And uh, I knew immediately I lost it. So I powered off and the plane right. leveled out. Yep. I kept a little power on it and come around. And as I decrease power, the elevator's in neutral. So. You go sinking too fast, a little power, turn it back up until you get on the ground. Of course, it's running pretty fast when it gets on the ground, but you save it. But there's not a lot of people that can do this because it takes, you've got to first realize what you lost. Then you have to keep calm about what you're doing and how what you do to first get it to fly level. Mm -hmm. Then you have to keep your wits about you as far as controlling your speed. And there's not a lot of people that can keep all that together and going and save an airplane. But anyway, LT1. This, what this, it was. LT1, that's right. Yeah, LT1. But this man had that ability in his heyday. And he was 50 years old at the time yep. in those days. 50, 55. 50, 55, maybe. Uh, I, I bet you the man can still fly a radio control model airplane. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah I mean, uh, it's good. I'm, I'm That's say. like when they told me I couldn't take that LT-40 trainer and cover it. Flatten the wing out, move the CG and the incidence right, yep. take off at about that distance and cover it now, with a what, trainer. <laughs> what, he, what he's saying is it's tail heavy as hell. <laughs> 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 I mean, it doesn't land. It, it, you, you have to land. You have to fly. I mean, you have to fly because it isn't. It isn't. Uh, it isn't. Not a trainer land. anymore. No, it ain't no trainer no more. Yeah. Oh, well, anyway, now I wanted to, one of the thing else I wanted to talk about is some of the experience you had flying. In some of the things that you experienced flying radio control. In, but one of the biggest things was that a cross country flight. And to I don't, El Paso. But what was it for? It was uh, some something to raise money or yeah, uh, muscular dystrophy. But, okay, and this was when? Uh, it was before I. It was somewhere in the seventies. Yeah, uh, I was still flying the craft single sticks. Okay. Well, I didn't get to fly. Actually, I had to drive the pickup. I was but, only but, one but the only one that had to pick Tell up. that story about how you did that. Now, you did it down Interstate 20. Mm -hmm. and, and tell we exactly built a, how you did it. Well, to start with, you wanted to fly more than 16 ounces of fuel because that don't take you very far. So we built a LT, a senior telemaster. telemaster. And, uh, but you built more than one. We built several. Uh, we tried several different ways, but what was killing us was the weight because we put a, a little over a quart of fuel in it, and that's heavy. Oh, that's heavy. But we moved the tank back to the center of the wing, and uh, we experimented until we got it going, and then uh, we would fly. You could not fly, you couldn't drive over 55 miles an hour, and they put a uh, monitor man in with you to watch his speed and uh, fly along Interstate 20 and 
You're sitting yeah. in the back of a truck, sitting pickup in, truck. In the back of a pickup truck flying this airplane, and I'm driving the pickup, and uh, you've got a guy up front, and you're talking on the radio, uh, trying to find a spot to land when you run out of fuel. Mm -hmm. Usually a, a side road or... Or a rest stop. Yeah, something. something if you was lucky enough to uh, be that lucky. Right, and we lost the uh, engine at one time after Monahan's, and the guy flying the airplane actually landed on the interstate and then run off the interstate. When, uh, where did you start on the interstate? When, do you remember? Uh, was it Sweetwater or somewhere like that, or Colorado City? Or? We started Sweetwater. Sweetwater? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it took us. Well, it just two days, actually. Uh, we stopped overnight in uh, Monahans or Pecos. They had us rooms uh, already chartered there, and if you had any trouble or anything, well, you had to fix it that night before you took off the next morning. And of all things, they set up a catch net on a vacant lock, you had to come in and land and the net yeah, caught you. Yeah. But we didn't have any trouble with ours that time. We cleaned it up and refueled it and was ready to go the next morning. So this is a flight of, from Sweetwater to, where did we go? El Paso. El Paso. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's 300 and... 300. About 400 miles. Well, I was thinking it's 335 or 340, no, something like 387 that. 387 from here. If I remember right, in about 400 miles. Well, 400 yeah. miles, and that's. But the but the funny thing is, is you could only go so well. I mean, the interstate. What was it? 70 at that time. Yeah, but I couldn't drive at 55. You could. That's drive. all they allowed that's, us to drive. Now the hard part. I remember you were telling me the hard part was that you the airplane went faster than that. So the airplane had, went faster. So you had to do a lot of circling. Uh -huh. to, to not get past the, the... Airplane actually flew faster than that, but we were not allowed to drive any faster than 55. 55. Mm -hmm. And what was that reason? Do you remember? Safety? I don't remember what their deal was there. Safety? But, but that, uh, you know, that, that was quite an undertaking. I haven't heard of anything like that in in this world, and I don't even know if they would even let you attempt something like that. Anymore. I don't either. I don't either. We made a practice flight from here, Big Springs, to Midland one time. Uh, and we was actually on 20, and I was driving 55, and old boy sitting in the back flying an airplane, and he actually hit a guy wire off a tower. You can't see him, and he actually hit a guy wire off a tower and went That's in the right field. Yeah. 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 Was that George Gatlin? No, no that no, was uh, Murphy. Murphy, okay. George Gatlin was was uh, George is really, really instrumental in. in well, he's one that trained me most okay. of, mostly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but he he. He was one of those older guys we talked about uh, uh, that you, that you, uh, one of the, I mean, they were the pioneers. Yeah. A lot of these guys we knew were pioneers, just mm -hmm. like you were, but just a tiny bit ahead of, uh, just yeah. a tiny bit ahead of you. And probably some of them were uh, very, most of these guys were uh, professionals. Yes. They had money, is what I'm trying to get. They had the money to throw at this. Um, one, one guy, the red, red, he had a, he had a, a, a hobby store. Oh see, yeah, I forgot red, about him. Red, he worked at the refinery. I don't remember what his name was. Yeah. He had a hobby store, so he had the money to put into the hobby. Yeah. But if that's about why he was a little bit behind these other guys. Oh yeah. I, I, I was raising a family. I couldn't afford it. Right. Right. I, I had to pay him. So work lots of late hours. <laughs> so we get into the. We talked about where we we're, we're into the two strokes. Mm -hmm. I remember that the four stroke was in the '80s, mm -hmm. but they were really underpowered. Yes, the first ones they come out with wasn't uh, a good two stroke would. Would outperform them, right? Oh yeah, but my, they they still had a, the four strokes were a little different sound, and they got better gas uh -huh. thing, but they just was really underpowered. Underpowered, and then I guess the 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 the, uh, the OS four strokes and the and the uh, where they really start coming on to their own in was, the nineties. Yeah, and. Uh, 
As a matter of fact, there's some four strokes right there. Yep. Yep. Uh, the the Sados were were our choice. Yes. Sado uh, was the was the that was OS the hot was rod okay, of the motor. but the 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 OS had that damn pump on it. Not not all of them. Not all of them, but but the, it seemed like they the the the, the Sados didn't have to have. The pump. The pump, and you didn't have to put a assist as far as a glow, add-on glow thing to keep them nope. running. I did. We and did. We did do that because it was the safety factor to put that. Right. When you and, and you used most of the time you used your exhaust pressure on the fuel tank to right, right. help pressure the but fuel. But we down. also put we we take a deep a, a deep size battery mm -hmm. and we wire it to the plug. Mm -hmm. And when you went to less than a quarter throttle, you would switch you, yeah, on. Yeah, you'd wire it to where the, it the, would come on. It was just like you're trying to start it. It yeah. would starter power on the plug, and it would keep that uh, running. motor running. And, and we did it with a snap switch. Yes. You'd get on your throttle servo, you'd, you would uh, exactly. run down the, the, the throttle servo. You'd, it'd be coming down to where you was idling, and it have a, a switch on it, and it puts that switch... Uh, putting that power, Put power onto to the, the glow plug, and then they come out with electronic ones. Yeah. Right. Uh -oh. uh, okay, so the four strokes come along, mm -hmm. and they really. Uh, I, well, I didn't. I didn't really start. You started when you really liked four strokes. Mm -hmm. Was on the Warbirds. Yes. I remember you buying. Uh, well, there's one right over there on the wall. It's a. Uh, and I think they still make that airplane. It's a P Hangar 9 P-51. That's the best flying airplane you've ever seen. It, and and it was a 60 size? They no, they've got an 80 on it. No, but you... It's a 60 size airplane. Yeah. But I got a four-stroke 80 on it. No, you've got a four-stroke 100 on there. If I got a 100 on you it? you got a 100 on it. That's right. I do. I do you have do. a 100. I don't remember better than you do. But you talk about a rocket yep. with a four-stroke 100 with the right prop on that airplane. It is a sweet yep. flying airplane. And lands good. Yep. 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 It does. I mean, but the Hangar 9 P-51, I think they still make it or something similar to it. That airplane is at least 15 years old. At least. And, uh, but, I'd but, say older than that. But a great plane, and, and that's where the four-stroke... And, and I'll never forget, me and you went to Lubbock one time. Do you remember going to Lubbock and watching that guy fly those four-strokes that he had hopped up that was going... They were doing 100, 120 miles oh, an hour. Oh, yeah. I don't, yeah. I, with those warbirds, I mean, that was just... It was awesome. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, that was... I don't remember... But he was getting some performance out of those. What was mm -hmm. it? A YS engine? Yes, they were YS. They were YS four-stroke engines. Mm -hmm. That's the ones that YS. Ooh. All of the YS engines has got fuel pumps on them. Yeah, man. That, I just remember that. How awesome those airplanes, those Warbirds. They were screaming. Yep. I mean, they had to be doing 130, 140 miles an hour. Easy. And back then, that was really really getting it and it still is today yeah but you gotta uh, be on your toes to fly on that fast the other thing that i remember before we start we, we're going to kind of end this i know it's getting lengthy but i, I really like talking to charles and, but, and we're sitting here remembering old times and it's really nice for me and i hope one of these days you guys have the same memories as charles and i about this sport but the thing that i've Remember me and you doing together. We were always going to do something together. We're going to build a big airplane. When we get retired, we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. Or we, that's all we're going to do is fly radio control wild airplanes. But anyway, the thing that I remember was I asked you to go to Bomber Field in Katy, Texas. Yep. We, I remember that. We being here in West Texas, we had our little fun flies in middle and Odessa, but. We didn't know what any, we all, all all it was was a dream when we looked in AMA magazine and we said Top Gun and and uh, uh, even uh, Joe Nall yeah all those were just dreams of ours because we were so far out here in the middle of the boonies we we just never did think about anything like that yeah but one time I, it, this was about 
2005, seven, somewhere in there, somewhere, somewhere. Mm. Ten? No, it doesn't. No, I think it was before 2000. No. It was, well, anyway, it was somewhere. In somewhere the, around there. I think it was somewhere maybe the early 2000s, somewhere. We decided, I decided, and I said, Charles, I want to go down to Bomber Field in Katy, Texas to see all the quarter scale because that was the big thing. That, the biggest thing around us was there. Yeah. So here we pack our little, we get our flight out of Middle and Odessa and we'll fly to Houston and we travel over to Katy to see Bomber Field and I wasn't disappointed. Only thing we were disappointed at, we didn't have no damn airplane to fly. Yeah, exactly. We was so a through, lot of beautiful oh, airplanes. The, the, the thing that I remember the most, you remember what I'm talking about? It happened to be a B-24. Oh, yeah. And man, this thing was the, the dragon in its tail. This thing was a quarter-scale B-24 chrome. Yeah, but it never did fly. Immaculate. Yeah. No, it did. Did it? I don't remember. I remember it sitting on the stand over there and then working on the motors and stuff. But it had two-stroke motors on it. Mm -hmm. We're looking at that airplane. This thing was immaculate. But... Now I remember this. He was flying it on an old gold. Gold. Mm -hmm. This was an eighty model radio, and he's flying it on this old gold thing. It had two stroke engines on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, don't you remember? It took off, and he kept having trouble with the motors. Yeah, I remember now. <laughs> yep. And Charles goes, "My God, well, how do you do something like that and put such crap on that radio? That beautiful air." He lost a motor on it. He lost both motors on one side yep and the one kept dying sitting there on running and charles says you put it down leave it alone do something different go buy a new radio good go buy some good engines he's gonna lose it you predicted it it took off i mean this thing was immaculate it was beautiful he Huge. took off it made the left hand turn one engine went <laughs> and then he never get it straightened out after that. No, he left, lost the other one on the same side. And man, it looked like World War II because that thing just spiraled in, just just like it was hit with flak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I, I, it was. I hurt my teeth to <laughs> see that thing crash. But uh, th that was the that was the other thing that we seen was the that that largest. It was a what was it? It's a oh, uh, it was a Russian. Oh, uh, bear. Yeah, the bear. That's the one I'm thinking of that was on the stands. Yeah, but big. They, they big. I mean, big for airplane. that time period, it was big. That mm -hmm. thing was huge. But they also had, they all, also flew those B-17s. There was a lot. Oh, there's a bunch of them. Eight to ten B-17s. Mm -hmm. And then nothing, it, was, it was just like going to Joe Nall, But I've seen more there then than I have at Joe Nall in the last few years. Really? I mean, but anyway, here we go. That takes you kind of through, of course, uh, 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 if, it's, if it's, he's had quarter scale, we're going to show you some of his quarter scale stuff. Uh, some of it that he hasn't finished. Some of it that he did finish. Uh, but it, how many airplanes do you think you built? Oh, God. Would you just take a guess? 300, 400? Oh, I think more than that. I think more like a thousand. Yeah. Or uh, more. This room full. Yeah, well, I know, but I mean, from uh, the from the 50s to yeah. now. Oh, I'm they ain't no cousins, yeah. And, and he also, I've got to say this. You remember me telling you when you said you first started out and you had kids and mm -hmm. you didn't have any place to build, so you'd build in your living room. Yep. And every night you build on that. You'd come home from work. You'd build on that airplane until uh, twelve or one o'clock in the morning. But Larry wouldn't let you have it all scattered out, so you had to pick it all up, up, put it up, and then go to bed, go to work. <laughs> and I'd come home the next day. That's scattered. the way I'd, I'd put that Heathkit radio together. Scattered sitting, it out. Yeah, sitting right there what in the living room on a. Well, then fold up trays. <laughs> so, guys, I'm just saying you got it. If you, 
Got to be dedicated. You don't understand. I'm just trying to get over to you guys and give you an idea of, of where and how much dedication there was to getting your sport to where it is today. So, Charles, I'm going to let you sit there and kind of wave at people. I'm going to get the the uh, camera. And okay. I'm probably, probably going to turn it off. And then I'm going to pick up the camera, and then we'll start video and okay. uh, your planes. And All I, right. okay, guys. So we're we're he's got planes hanging everywhere, and and he did start out with some of the, the early electric airplanes. So look at this one. Look at that one. See that 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 early that that one goes around about the turn of the century. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were flying, uh, we were starting those things at the Coliseum. Yeah. He's and here, here's a float plane he scratched, built, and, and started to build. And it he, turned out tail heavy and uh, redoing it. Yep, float plane. And there's a, there's a top flight uh, Spitfire that's built, kind of. Oh, it's ready. It's ready. And then I don't know what the red one is over there on that side. It's another. Oh, it's a, it was a. What is that cane? I forgot what that was, that red plane. I can't think of the name of it. Uh, it was, anyway. But there's the Hangar 9 P-51 with a 104 stroke motor. And I don't know how many flights he flew it, but oh, hey, that thing's no probably feeling. got hundreds of flights on it, on that P-51. Everybody's got the plane of shame, the tail on there. So he's got that. Now, what I'm gonna do is swing around here there's another electric airplane. That's a, I had one of those myself. Uh, I, I kidded about what a trainer was, but that's one of his. But here's just, what I'm fixing to show you is nothing but wings. This is nothing but wings. Okay? Wings. Well, there's. Well, there is one plane down here at the end that's all one. Four. Oh yeah, there's a there's a Corsair in there, and there's some more fuses in there. This is a twin. I remember this airplane is a twin. Flies great. Uh, yeah, I, it was built by. Was it Hangar Nine? It's a Hangar Nine. I forgot what the name of it was. And then this big old yellow thing here, and it's probably it's got, got a gas gas engine, gas engine on, it. on it, like a. Uh, G G46. G46. Yeah. Which we still do that today. And then there is a a a uh, kind of like a steerman, and it's got like a four-stroke. Uh, looked like about a hundred, maybe one twenty, one twenty. Yeah, on it. And then there's a cap here hanging on the wall. Is a lot of people gave him some stuff over the years that made out of Coca-Colas and. And I think maybe his granddaughter built some of the uh -huh. things yeah, for him. You're right. And then uh, here's some of just the, that ultra stick was just fun to fly. Yeah. And then he's got the Pawnee or the 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 uh, the uh, uh, plane that is to uh, the, the duster plane, whatever. We yeah, have some of those. Crop duster. Crop duster, thank you. And here, here's a plane that's an ARF today. That's a Stinson, right? Yes, but Stinson. But it was, it was built. Yes. It wasn't an ARF. No, this, it wasn't an ARF. And it's got a seven-stroke radial on it, if I remember. Seven-cylinder. Seven-cylinder. Okay. But this is just what a hobby or shopper looks like over a long period of time. I mean, if every one of those things are full of something or, or a tool to do something with. But now here's some of his last... What happened What happened to the P-51, Byron's P-51? I sold it. You sold it. He had one of the original Byron's P-51s, mm -hmm. and it was hanging there where that float had plane was. It reduction on it. Yep, it, had a, it actually had a belt reduction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now this is a Cessna 310 that's huge. I can't get far enough back to see it all. Oop, I have almost. But that's just the fuse. And then, I don't remember what that one is. I don't know what that one is. I kind of acquired that one. And Wesley, 
Y'all have, have heard Wesley say that he'd like to have one big airplane. Well, here it is. It's a DC-3 DC or a C-47. It's all built up and it's got gas motors and it's got the retracts in it and uh -huh. all that. It's just not, it's, it's got air retracts. Yes. And it's all, this is all built up wood guys. This is, I mean, this is uh, balsa sheeted and the wings are built and uh, I don't, we, Wesley and I, I told Charles, I said, the problem with Wesley and I, it costs, uh, I mean, he'd sell it for a good price. If you guys are interested in this, I'm going to, any of this stuff you see, he might be able to sell you if you're interested in it. I'm going to give you Charles's email address, and if you see something that you might be interested in buying, he might sell it to you. Uh, but he's he's not just, but, but that, that, that 310 always fascinated me. I wanted to do something like that. Yeah. But uh, yeah. It, but anyway, guys, that's the that's the story about a, a modeler's life and what he does and how he what what dedication you have to have, what the space you have to have to do this. So anyway, Charles, it was just a wonderful day uh, remembering things and thank you Great. for your time. Uh, that you gave us to remember some of the days of your experience in RC. And guys, I hope you enjoyed this. We're going to end it now. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Go uh, look up that st our, our Teespring store to, to all our t-shirts. Uh, go to Cali Graphics. Uh, we got some stuff there too. Uh, Cali's a great place to go to to get those graphics for your airplane and look up the boozer uh, material on there so remember what we say fly with your friends and we'll see you next time